Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers at Jaffrey. I know that knowing the quality of the husbands in this church, I know you will be celebrated today, and uh, you deserve it. You really deserve it. Um, for this Mother's Day, we're supposed to be in the Gospel of Mark and finishing that up, but um, number one, I didn't feel like we needed another sermon on the end times. I thought what we did last week was, or last two weeks was sufficient. And also, as I was thinking about what to give to the mothers of our church, um, I didn't have like um, a video this year. Uh, I didn't have, um, yeah, uh, any gold or silver to give you. And I felt like what, what I could give you this year was God's word. That was the best thing I could give you this year. And I'm praying that as God's word um, speaks into your life, um, that would be such a gift and a blessing to each one of the mothers in this room. Um, the message is about two mothers, but the message really is for everyone too. So don't think, uh, well, this is, not, this is only for mothers, so I don't have to listen. I can just check out. Um, no, it's, it, the message is for everyone, but it's, the theme has to do with God's grace to two mothers. Um, before we get to the sermon, as we always do, uh, let's ask God for his help. And, and thank you to the two mothers who served today, for Elaine and for Holly. Um, I love it, Holly, when, you, like, when God just aligns the songs with the prayers that he's been putting on my heart this morning for our church. So let me, let me pray, and, and then we'll, we'll get to the sermon. God, thank you that this morning um, we come before the Ancient of Days. We, we come before the Holy One. We become before the Lord Almighty. We come before the one who is living, who died and rose from the grave and is now seated in the heavens ruling. Thank you, Lord, um, for how big you are. Thank you, Lord, that you transcend um, all that we can go through in this world. At the same time, I thank you that you are so close to us in your amazing love. Thank you, Lord, that as we are sitting here together in your presence, your mercy is immense and free. And as we sang this morning, Lord, what we are praying is that the chains would fall, the chains would break. You would give us true freedom, a freedom of our hearts. Not just to be independent, but Lord, a freedom to follow after you, to be people of worship, of glorifying you, of knowing you, a people whose lives we know is in your hands and that you are gracious. So God, we come before you now. Lord, we, we, we just drop all of our agendas this morning. I don't want to, please do not let my agenda come through here. Lord, we want you to just speak and minister to people as you would. We leave this in your hands, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've read about Abraham in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, you'll know the backstory to our passage today. You know that God called Abram, and when he called Abram, it wasn't just to, just to call, just for the sake of calling him. It was he had a promise, and he had a blessing for Abram and his life and his, and his future family as well. And these promises and blessings, they were specific to his family. So in order for him to receive these promises, to fulfill these promises and this blessing, he had to have an heir. He had to have a son specifically. But we're told all the way back in Genesis 11 that that's what he didn't have. We're told all the way back in Genesis 11 that, number one, Sarai is barren, and as the years are going by, that child never came. That child to build their family never came. But what happens in Genesis 15, right before our passage here, is that God shows up to Abram in a vision, and he says, he reaffirms the promises, and he reaffirms and reassures him that, yes, the promises and the blessings are going to be fulfilled. They're coming. So when we come out of Genesis 15, we're like 
we're feeling pretty good. We're feeling pretty optimistic. We're like, okay, you know, Abraham, Abraham's going to get this, right? He's going to be confident now. But this issue comes back in Genesis 16. So that's where we begin. And Genesis 16, it begins by reintroducing us to Sarai and repeating the issue of her infidelity. Infertility, sorry. Not infidelity. Infertility. <laughs> that's two totally different things. In the ancient Near Eastern culture, um, as I don't know if this is kind of sad, but in that time and in that culture, a woman's worth, her value, her identity was tied to her ability to have children. We read of women like Rachel and of Hannah in the Bible, and you see that when they can't have children, how much they grieve, how bitter it is. And for Abraham and Sarah, we are told in, this, in chapter 16 that it's been 10 years, 10 years since they left Abraham's father and they went to go live in Canaan where God gave them those promises of blessing. And also this though, since, that, since Genesis 11, that 10 years, it's been 10 years of just suffering for Sarai, of suffering in silence, in shame and frustrated hopes. God, here's God saying, this promise, the blessing is coming. The promises are coming. They're going to be fulfilled. And 10 years in, she's just suffering in silence. Very quickly, the text introduces us to a second character named Hagar. Note that in this introduction that Sarai is introduced first by her name, but not Hagar. Hagar is introduced first as belonging to Sarai, as her servant, as her possession. And then for the first time, we read where since Genesis 11, it was silent. Sarah has just been silent for 10 years. The first time we read her and voice her complaint. She says in verse, um, in the first, first uh, couple of verses, she voices her complaint. And first she says, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. She doesn't blame her biology, you know. She blames God. And this is something that um, if you read the Bible, those who faced infertility in the Bible, they believe that God was ultimately the one who opened and closed wombs. But what makes this even more disappointing is because it's not just about having children. Remember that there were these promises of blessing tied to having children. So not only is it, on one hand, just on a very human level, the disappointment of not having children, but on an even deeper level, a spiritual level, is that these promises and blessings are going unfulfilled. And it's because, the reason is because Sarah can't have children. God is withholding these promises and blessings. So if God is withholding her having a child, and by association withholding his promises and blessings, in these first two verses, we see Sarai decide, you know what? If that's what God is doing, I'm going to come up with a plan of my own. I'm going to make these promises and blessings come about. Because Hagar is Sarai's possession, she will take Hagar, give her to Abram as a second wife to produce a child of promise and receive the blessings. And this will seem like a completely, like in our day today, this is completely unreasonable and completely foreign. Actually, Actually, I don't know. Our, our society is getting a little weird, but um, I think for most of us here sitting here, like all of us here, we're, this is pretty foreign. This is like unreasonable, right? This is like, this is a weird practice. But in that culture, it was completely legitimate to provide your husband with a concubine or a servant to bear a child if a wife was barren. And we see this in Scripture because that's what happens with Rachel. 
Rachel is unable able to have children, she gives her servant to Jacob, who has a child. And Rachel takes that child as her own. Now, that's the custom. When the servant has a child, that child is considered not the servant's child, but the wife's child. So, to build a family, there's really three options here, right? To, to build a family and to receive the promises and the blessings, there's three options. Number one, Abraham and Sarai have a child. Okay, that's not, that's not going to work right now because Sarah is barren, she can't have children. Option one is out. Option two, adoption, right? That was a legitimate practice back then too. You can adopt someone into your family who was not blood-related, but that would become an heir of your estate. In Genesis 15, the chapter just right before, God's, God ruled that out. He said the, the child of promise is not going to be um, someone who is just adopted. The heir is going to come from your body. So option number two, that's out. There's only one option left, option number three. Take a servant, give that servant to Abram as a second wife to bear the child of promise. And this was not considered a violation, at least Sarai didn't consider this a violation of the promise because she believed that the promises were given to Abram. If you notice, every time that God gave the promise, it was given to Abram. So she thought, these promises are not necessarily given to me. They're given to Abram. So as long as Abram has a child, I can receive the promises and the blessings. So to summarize, so where God withheld, right, Sarai took matters into her own hands. And unfortunately, um, on this passage, uh, the English translation will never be able to do it justice. But if we were to read this in Hebrew, right, and we read verses 2 and 3 in Hebrew, we would have immediately recognized there are parallels to the Hebrew words used in Genesis 3. Abraham, Abram listening to the voice of Sarai, those words parallel Adam listening to Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Sarai taking Hagar and giving to Ab- Abram parallels Eve taking the forbidden fruit and giving to Adam. This passage is actually pointing us back to a theme in Genesis chapter 3. This passage goes back to how Adam and Eve responded when the serpent deceived them and made them think God was withholding from them. God was withholding the knowledge of good and evil. God was withholding independence and being their own gods. Eve then saw the forbidden fruit was pleasing to the eye, and this is really key, and this is one of the most key points in the Bible, I believe. It was desirable for gaining wisdom. In other words, Eve saw in that forbidden fruit a wisdom outside of God that she thought, you know what, that makes sense. And she took matters into her own hands. She took the fruit and ate it and gave some to to Adam. It's this theme. It's this theme that Genesis 16 is coming back to. And there's a few questions that I want us to consider as we go through the rest of the sermon, if I could have that on the, the PowerPoint. I believe these are the questions that this passage is asking us to consider. How do we respond when God withholds from us? Do we look to wisdom outside of God? Do we look to our own wisdom as what really helps us to navigate life? Do we take matters into our own hands and keep God out of the picture when he withholds? Do we trust that what God is withholding is ultimately for our blessing? These are some of the questions this passage 
is asking us to consider. You know, it was uh, a long journey for our family to move into the house that we're currently in. Um, there were many places that we were looking at, and it, not just like, it wasn't just like a looking as like um, just a house. We were really praying and trying to discern, like, God, where are you leading us? And there were many times where we felt like it almost looked like, like everything's lining up, like this is God moving so we can move to this place. And for 10 years, God was shutting one door after another. I don't know if pun intended or not, but God was shutting one door after another, shutting one opportunity after another. And like Sarai, when that happens, when that happens, of course, like, you feel tempted to stop listening to God, like stop listening for God and start listening to the wisdom of man. Some voice is telling us, like, by hook or by crook, any way possible, just get into the market. We were tempted to push God out of the picture, right? We're not going to keep waiting. We're not going to wait 10 years. We're going to take matters into our own hands. We're going to make it happen. Whatever way we have to, we're going to make it happen. And looking back now, and hindsight is always twenty twenty. but looking back now, like I believe that if we had just taken that attitude and not waited upon God for 10 plus years, I believe we would have put ourselves in a very compromised situation. Um, but thank God that you know, we were, somehow God was able to help us to see the journey to the end. But, you know, that's, that's just stuff. Honestly, that, that's just a house. What is God withholding from you that is hurting you? Like Sarai, for maybe the mothers here, is God withholding something from our families today? Maybe you're exactly like Sarai, you're trying to have children, can't have children right now. Maybe some of us, you know, we're like, we're looking at our family and we're like, I wish our family was different. We're looking at our children and we're, we're saying, I wish my children were better at blank. What is, maybe like Sarai, what is God withholding from your family? What is God withholding in terms of community and friendships or marriage or personal healing or personal growth? What is that area that God is withholding that is hurting us? And how do we respond? That's what this passage is asking us to consider. Do we believe that whatever God is withholding from us today, no matter how good it is, that there it's for a greater blessing? Do we trust him? Sarah's, Sarai's plan is, is working. Hagar gets pregnant. But the plan also backfires. How, how can it not, like, you take matters into your own hands. You, you are not going to live by God's wisdom, but you're going to live by your own wisdom. How can it not backfire? It shouldn't be surprising to us. So in the one hand, it's working. On the other hand, it backfires. Remember that Hagar was a servant. She belonged to Sarai, and she was her possession. And she was socially elevated to be Abram's second wife. In a culture where it's disgraceful for a wife to be barren, inevitably what happens is when Hagar gets pregnant, she doesn't only see herself as Sarai's equal. She begins to look down on Sarai. We expect Sarai to, be, to blame Hagar. Right? How dare you look down on me? Who do you think you are? She doesn't do that. She goes and she blames Abram. And you might think, what, what did Abram do? What did Abram do? He's just out there farming. What, what, what did he do? 
he do? Why are you blaming him? Hagar is doing this to you. When Sarai elevated Hagar from slave or servant to a second wife, she was no longer under Sarai, but became the responsibility of Abram. And what Abram has failed to do is protect Sarai again. And we see a pattern of this in their relationship, at least early on. Actually, I don't know. I don't know if you can say early on. He's like 87 now. <laughs> I'm sorry, wives, for all the things that you endure. But um, remember that when um, Abraham, uh, Abraham and Sarai went to Egypt, what did he do? He told Sarai, don't tell, don't tell Pharaoh you're my wife, because then he'll kill me and take you as his wife. So they go. Pharaoh doesn't know that Sarai, Pharaoh thinks Sarai is Abram's sister, and he takes her as one of his wives. And Abram never speaks up. He just lets this thing play out. And actually, God has to intervene then too. So second time, Abram has not protected Sarai. So when Sarai blames Abram for again not protecting her, Abraham, Abram demotes Hagar back to a servant under Sarai. Abram says in verse 6, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. And essentially what Abram is doing when he demotes Hagar from second wife back to servant of Sarai is he's, he is essentially divorcing her. And we're told that Sarai treated her harshly and Hagar fled into the dangers of the wilderness. Let's kind of take an inventory here. Hagar is a young woman on her own, never a safe thing, not, not good for survival in that, in that culture and in that society. She is pregnant and soon to be single mother. She is recently divorced. She is a runaway slave. She has suffered trauma. She has lost her home. She's an Egyptian outsider who is now a refugee. Not only is Hagar socially insignificant in this world, sorry, that's just the reality, but she is a total mess as a person. She is the definition of the kind of person that nobody cares about in this world except God. And that's what we read about next in our passage. We're told that the angel of the Lord found Hagar in the wilderness. The term angel of the Lord is, theologically we say that it's God in his immediacy. God coming quickly to people. God coming urgently to people. The Hebrew words themselves suggest that angel of the Lord is God coming to people in human form. The phrase, it's used 58 times in Scripture. And the very first time that God appears as the angel of the Lord in his immediacy, in his um, urgency, being very present to someone, is not to giants like Moses, Elijah, or David. He will. But the first time, not to them. The very first time God appears as the angel of the Lord is to Hagar who is a mess, who no one cares about. And when God speaks to Hagar, he addresses her by her name first and then her social standing. God reverses the order that she was introduced in the beginning of this passage, right? Her first identity in the beginning of the passage was servant belonging to Sarai, and then her name. God reverses that. He's addresses her first as Hagar. His first, the way he dresses her first as, is as a person. He affirms her first as a person before a, he addresses her by her social status. But secondly, he does address her social status and affirm her social status, that she is servant of 
Sarai. And then he asks her a, a rhetorical question. Where have you come from, and where are you going? Does God not know where she came from? Just acknowledge that she's servant of Sarai. He knows where she came from. This is a rhetorical question. And once again, this goes back to Genesis chapter 3. Because after Adam and Eve ate the fruit and God went to the garden, what did he ask? What was the first question he asked? Where are you? Now, does God not know where they are? After they sinned, ate the fruit, and were hiding? This rhetorical question in Genesis chapter 3 is addressing that, it's God's way of addressing that something has gone wrong. And that's the same way in which this question is addressed to Hagar. That she is in the wrong place. Where are you? Where did you come from? And where are you going? Hagar, you're in the wrong place. Hagar's response is, um, I'm fleeing. That key, that, that's the key word there, fleeing. I'm fleeing my mistress. Right? That word fleeing, it's like that's the word that they used when Israel was leaving Egypt. They were fleeing oppression. So basically what she's saying, I have, I have a good reason to be here in the wilderness right now. I have a good reason to be here. But God's question is rhetorical in the sense of it's, it's saying, you're in the wrong place. Then God says this in verse 9, return to your mistress and submit to her. Uh, are you kidding me right now? God knows that she'll be returning to affliction. He even says it. He even, he even says it in verse 11. God acknowledges in verse 11 that she came from affliction and misery. God is saying, go back to that. Like, this sounds so absurd. This sounds so tone deaf. God, like, what are you, like, this doesn't make any sense. We're back with the theme of how we respond when God withholds from us. Hagar wants to get away from a situation of being treated harshly by Sarai. Now God is withholding her independence and telling her to go back. See, when God meets Hagar in the wilderness, it's not all about Hagar being the victim and God only saying words of validation. Be careful of this world. I think our world right now is just very imbalanced. It's, it's, a world, it's a world for victims. It's all about who's the victim and supporting the victims and just validating them as if, if the victims are more moral. The Bible doesn't speak that way. It speaks of people as sinners. It's, God doesn't just come and say, you know what? God doesn't just come to her and just address her as a victim and it's validate her. God's compassion is oceanic. It's deep. He cares when no one else does. But when God meets Hagar in the wilderness, he also brings her to account. And you, that's an aspect of God that you have to know, that we all have to know, that when God addresses us too, he will bring us to account. And this is not because God doesn't um, it's just trying to be hard. God cares so much that he will not just say pleasant words that are empty words, that are void of truth. Not only does God tell Hagar to go back, that's, that's bad enough, but go back and submit to Sarai. Put yourself, basically, I think the literal Hebrew words is put yourself under her hand. Remember what caused her to be treated harshly and run away. Her attitude of looking down on Sarai and her barrenness when she got pregnant. And yeah, looking down on Sarai because she was barren and she was pregnant. She got pregnant. God is telling her that her attitude wasn't right. 
and to go back with the right attitude and put herself under Sarai to correct the wrong that was done. And Hagar is also to go back because even though God is withholding her independence, there is a greater blessing for her and her family. God says in verse 10, I will surely multiply your offspring so they cannot be numbered for a multitude. Does that sound familiar? For those of you who have read Genesis, does that sound at all familiar? That was part of the promise that God gave Abram. God is going to bless Hagar's family line through Abram, so she needs to go back. And then God speaks a blessing over Hagar. God says, Hagar is pregnant with a son who she is to name Ishmael, which means God hears, because God heard Hagar's affliction and misery. And God is also going to bring a blessing to Ishmael. When we read that Ishmael is going to be a wild donkey of a man, he will be against everyone and everyone against him. He will live in hostility toward all his brothers. It sounds like, this doesn't sound like a blessing. It sounds like a curse. It sounds like this is a rough life. But that's why you, we have to, it's so important to read in context, not to just pull passages out and, and read them, just lift them out of their context and read them and understand them, or to, to read them in a vacuum. That's, that's, that's why we're going through Sunday school. It's so important to read them in context. The point that God is making is not about conflict, but Ishmael being a man living a nomadic life of independence. See, the independence that God withheld from Hagar for her good and her blessing, Ishmael is going to receive that. That's the point. And Hagar's response even tells us that these are words of blessing. They're not curses. Because when she responds, how does she respond? She called on the name of the Lord and worshipped, saying, You are God of seeing. Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. And she also named the well where she made God as Behir Lahai Roy, which means the well of the living one who sees me. In the midst of God withholding something Hagar really wanted, she called on the Lord. She invited him into the situation. She worshipped him. But she, because she encountered one who hears and sees and cares for those who are a complete mess. You guys know, you guys know a lot of my stories here, but let me tell you, let me repeat one from a different angle. When I got rejected from seminary, and I was told, these are your options. Either don't come to our school or go back to U of T and upgrade your GPA and get, um, get uh, what is it called, uh, reference letters at a time when it was so hard to get reference letters. And maybe you can come back. It's not even like for sure. It's like maybe you can come back. Maybe you can reapply and we'll accept you. And to me, that was like hitting a dead end. Like, you would think, no, but you have options here. Uh, going back to U of T, to me, was like hearing, how I heard that was, this is a dead end. And if you go to U of T, if you know, you know, right? Even if I did go back, I didn't know if I had the ability nor the integrity as a student to raise my GPA, get those reference letters, in a classroom of hundreds where professors at that time, they, don't respond, they didn't respond to emails, by the way, at that time. You had to go and meet them personally. I didn't know if I was going to get the reference letters. And I'm like, this is a, I think I'm at a dead end. Okay, like I literally have no future now. And that, I remember one morning I barely slept, slept like one hour. I just said, God, I need to hear you this morning. I'm so lost. I'm such a mess. I need to hear you this morning. And you guys know the story. I went online, listened to a sermon, and God just began to minister. There's a four-part sermon. I listened to them all in one sitting, and God was just ministering to me. The, the comfort and the peace 
didn't come because my situation had changed. All of a sudden, like, I was in seminary and, um, you know, I saw my future and everything was lining up. That morning, nothing had changed. I was still not in seminary. I didn't know if I was going to go back to U of T. I was in no man's land, basically. I didn't know if I had a future. My life was still a mess. I was still a mess. What gave me peace and comfort that morning? Simply that God sees me, he hears me, he cares. Just simply knowing that alone gave me comfort and peace that morning to move forward. Now, there's a lot of stuff that happened after that too. There was an empowering that I experienced that and abilities that God gave to me that I didn't know that that was what that was being given to me. I was listening to those sermons. My faith was strengthened. I found a confidence in life by encountering this God who sees me. And there have been many instances in my life where I've needed to once again meet the God who hears, who sees, who cares, even when no one else does. And no one else knows. Some of us were going through stuff that nobody else even knows about. God hears, He sees, He cares. And as I've gone through different moments in my life where I've been so lost or I was a mess, God has never failed to visit me as, the God, as, as that God who cares for us. If we want to know, I don't know what God is withholding from you today, but if you want to know how to walk through a time where God is withholding from you, you need to follow the footsteps of Hagar. Know the God who hears and sees us. Call on the name of the Lord. Invite him into your situation. Worship him. You might think, how's worship going to help? When you worship, whether that's through prayer or singing songs, or after you read a passage of scripture and you just pray, like you just worship him for who he is, how does that help? You come back to knowing who God really is. You, you, you come back to knowing how big our God is. You come back to knowing his compassion, his transcendence, his love, his mercy, immense and free. God becomes big in worship. Your problems become small. Whatever is, with, whatever is being withheld from you becomes really small because God is big. That's how worship helps. So, see, like, that's what Sarai, in the beginning of our passage, that's what she should have done. Instead of look to her own wisdom, take matters into her own hands, and try to bring about these blessings herself, As God was encountering Abram and Sarai, she should have been calling on the name of the Lord, inviting him into her situation, worshiping him. So, so is this passage all about, okay, Hagar got it right, God blessed her, and then Sarah got punished. Sarai got punished because she got it wrong. The passage ends with Hagar returning to Abram and giving birth to a son that Abram names Ishmael. By naming Hagar's son, Abram is wrecking Ishmael as his, as his legitimate son. Ishmael is going to receive the promise and blessing given to Abram that God mentioned. Then chapter 16 ends by telling us that Abraham was 86 years old. Chapter 17 opens by telling us Abram is now 99 years old. For 13 years, it looked like Sarah, Sarai's scheme had worked. For 13 years. Ishmael looked like the child of promise for 13 years. But 
there's something else that also happened. Remember I told you about Rachel? That when she gave her servant girl to Jacob, that child belonged to her. And she named that child. Guess who's missing from the naming of the child? Actually, it's Sarah, it's Sarah who's supposed to name the child. But she's absent. She's out of the picture. Sarai, in this scheme of hers, found herself outside the picture of the family, but also of the blessing and promises. By the end of chapter 16, you'll notice Sarai's name, who is so prominent throughout the passage, not mentioned once. And especially, as I said, in that key moment of naming, not mentioned. But when Abram is 99 years old in chapter 17, God doesn't have to, he doesn't have to intervene. Let's just recognize that for a second. God doesn't have to do anything. We're not entitled to anything. He doesn't have to intervene, but he graciously does intervene in chapter 17 and tells Abraham and Sarai that they will have a child in their own age, way past the, the years of parenthood, who will be the child of promise. Ishmael will receive a portion of the blessing given to Abram, but it will be through Sarah's child Isaac through whom the promises will be fulfilled. God graciously course corrects and brings Sarah back into the picture of the family and into the promises and blessings of God. God didn't have to intervene, but he does intervene even though Sarah sinned, because he's the God who hears and sees and cares, not just for Hagar, but for Sarah too. And that's the gospel message, friends. A God who sends his only son to intervene for sinners, for those who are a complete mess, to make them worshipers and followers people who will live the rest of their days in adoration of the living God. This is easily one of my favorite passages in the Bible. You can see why. Um, Mothers of Jeffrey, um, this passage reminds me that you are from a long line of mothers who have endured so much, who have had to walk the hard miles of being a mother in God's family, having to go through the ups and downs both spiritually and in life. But you are also mothers who has a God who intervenes, not because he has to, but because he hears and sees and cares for you. And even if you have to go through 13 years in the wrong direction, even if you do go 13 years in the wrong direction, Here's the truth. You cannot lose with God. So mothers, continue to lean into the grace of God. Continue to lean into calling on the name of the Lord. God, we just praise you for who you are. Thank you for your compassion on us. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you don't hold it against us when we're a mess. And Lord, in a way, both Sarai and Hagar were a mess. And yet, thank you, Lord, that you are a God who intervenes and just don't, doesn't just leave us to ourselves. You are truly the God who hears us, sees us, which means that you care for us like no other. Thank you for the ways in which you love every mother in this room. Thank you for the ways in which you love every person in this room. 
that if we lean into you, call on your name, invite you into our lives, into our situations, worship you, we can't lose. We cannot lose. So thank you for that assurance today that we have that came through Jesus' death and resurrection. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.